before I pick up the thread of the argument as I left it, uh, I understand that there is a question raised in one of the section meetings uh, for our discussion. Uh, Peter? I'm not sure I understand the uh, exact connotation. So uh, one interpretation is that has to do with the discussion of politics, the reformation of politics, the next subject we come to after the economy. But it seems that you're asking about something else, that is whether there is a particular moral direction uh, in this bigness? Is that, is that so the question? What the students raised was that bigness can be used for of course. further bad ends. Of and course. So, but, but now, in a way, this, this, it seems on its face that this question comes from a position that is the inverse of the position of classical liberal political theory. So the position of classical liberal political theory is that the order of institutions and of rights should be neutral among visions of the good and of humanity. Uh, it should not entrench any particular vision of the good. Now, let's not turn that on its head by then taking the idea that the institutional order should entrench some particular vision of the good. It can't be neutral, that's what I want to argue but it can be Catholic and open to a wide range of contradiction. So that's the first level answer, that it is not the aim of <coughs> this argument with respect to that problem to turn liberal political theory on its head and argue that the institutional order should be devoted to the cultivation of a particular vision of the good. Now, then comes the second theme that this is related to, uh, the different nations that exist in the world, the nation states, are the terrain for different visions of humanity. Uh, so we can't rank them in a hierarchy of good and bad. Uh, there are experiments in different ways of being human. Uh, we can engage in arguments over the advantages and disadvantages of each, the, uh, including the moral advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but on, on the view that I defended, the difference of nations in the world, sh in a world of democracies, should be understood as a form of moral specialization within humanity. Uh, now, I think it would be fair to say that the, the many of these proposals that I'm making do imply a, a conception of moral progress, if we can use that 19th century label. So, Uh, for example, an economic form that mixes cooperation and competition rather than assigning them to distinct compartments and that demands and permits a higher degree of discretion and trust among participants, not just in politics but in production, is superior to one that doesn't. Now, then it's fair to ask, uh, what's the criterion, what's the vision of humanity uh, 
in the light of which I am assuming that some of these social forms are higher than others. And it's true that these programmatic arguments are all informed by a vision of humanity. And that that vision is not simply descriptive, it's also normative. So let me now describe that vision in, in two ways, uh, with the aim of making explicit the, the assumptions about humanity throughout this programmatic argument. So the vision is a vision that says we are, we are situated, we are formed in context, as members of a particular social world, but we transcend these contexts. There is more in us than there is in them. This attribute of spilling over, of excess, this power of resistance and transcendence is one of our most important attributes. And uh, we should nourish it, we should develop it, we should give we should multiply occasions for its expression rather than suppressing it. Uh, there are contradictory conditions for our development. Uh, there's a contradiction in our relation to other people, and there's a contradiction in our relation to the social worlds that we inhabit. The contradiction in our relation to other people is that we need them, but they threaten us. So Jean-Paul Sartre says, the others are hell, but the others are also the salvation. So we are freer uh, and more human, more complete, to the extent that we're able to connect without being subjugated, without paying for connection the price of subjugation or depersonalization. Then there's a contradiction in our relation to engagement in a particular world. We must engage uh, in a particular world to be able to act, to have a full life, to develop ourselves. But uh, every engagement in a particular world threatens to exact as its price, surrender to that world. So we are freer, greater, more powerful, more human to the extent that we can engage without surrendering. And there comes then another criterion, that we would prefer those forms of life that allow us to be insiders and outsiders at the same time. So these two contradictions and the, the vision of a superior resolution to them are, are connected in, in, in many deep ways. So then, uh, the, the transformation of social life that we desire uh, should represent an advance by this light, by this standard. That's the conception of humanity summarized that underlies these, these arguments. Uh, and that makes one form of life superior to another form. If it allows us to widen and deepen our connections through the higher forms of cooperation without being subjugated, and if it allows us to engage in a particular social world without surrendering to it. In other words, denying it the last word and keeping the last word for ourselves. Uh, now, then I don't know whether you would be willing to apply the word virtue to that, but to me, uh, uh, that's what would count as moral progress in, in politics. And the idea of the shared bigness should be seen in the light of these aspirations. So that's what I'd say. Uh, so again, just to restate the idea that uh, 
I would resist the reversal of the <coughs> tenet of liberal political theory, which would be to replace the liberal idea of neutrality with a commitment to a particular narrowly defined version of humanity, which we would then label virtue. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I recognize that these arguments depend for their power on their appeal to a particular vision of humanity, uh, which they then unpack. And therefore, they are not normatively neutral. Uh, now, but that, that all of that is compatible within a wide range of institutional forms. There isn't one way to pursue those ideals. There are many ways. And that irreducible variety, then, is the justification for the existence of distinct nation states as the shield of different experiments in humanity. When we defend pluralism of that kind, we don't therefore commit ourselves to agnosticism or relativism, because we still engage in an argument about what is best. But we don't want the idea of what is best to be confined to a narrow sectarian version of social life. That's a summary of how I would begin to respond to the, to the question. I think, I think the, there's a problem in the use of this vocabulary of virtue, of civic virtue, because the vocabulary comes from a particular tradition in political theory, a tradition distinct from classical liberal political theory, as you said, civic republicanism or radical republicanism. And that tradition is tainted by what you could call bad utopianism. So the single most influential contrast in the history of, philo of political philosophy in the West, in the modern West, is Benjamin Constant's contrast formulated at the beginning of the 18th century by the, the, the Franco-Swiss political philosopher, Benjamin Constant, of the ancient and the modern republic. So the modern republic is the republic of interest-bearing individuals for whom politics is an anomalous activity. The real stuff is the pursuit of private interests, especially in the market. And then that is, is, is invidiously contrasted to the idea of the ancient republic, a mythical version of Rome or Sparta, in which the citizen lives for the public, for the collective good, for political life, political life rather than being an ecstatic deviation from normal experience, becomes the center, the selfless individual. And that, then, is labeled virtue. But that's not virtue. That's a monstrous perversion of humanity uh, and a fantasy. Uh, ancient Rome or ancient Sparta were never like that. And what that is is, uh, again, instead of being a transformation of modern democracy, it's what bad utopianism does. It's like the opposite of it. So it says something is missing here. We'll turn it upside down. So, uh, but it, it doesn't describe anything that's real. Uh, and unfortunately, the vocabulary of civic virtue is congenitally tainted by its association with that counter tradition. To me, that seems a very dangerous guide to transformative political thinking. Of course, in the minds of those who are attracted to this vocabulary and tradition, it is associated with uh, the value placed on political engagement. 
but I think it's a, uh, it's the bad way to go. It's a, it's a confused response to that legitimate commitment. So to, to deal with that commitment realistically and in a way that is fertile of real futures, we then have to engage the, the real individual and real societies, or the institutional legacy of democracy. These are indeed weak democracies that exist in the world. Uh, and explore, as I want to do throughout these arguments, how we can expand that repertory. So let me represent this contrast in the, in the most abstract form. Um, so you could say that there are, we, we have two basic classes of experiences or activities with respect to the structure of society. There are the routine activities that we undertake within a framework of assumptions and arrangements that we take for granted, including the economic and political institutions and the ideological preconceptions that are dominant in the society. And then there are the exceptional activities by which from time to time we challenge some piece of this framework, typically under the provocation of crisis. So you could describe the situation as one in which in the normal course of our experience, we are somnambulant, we are asleep, uh, we are a conformist, and then we're woken up by some crisis collectively and then we have this contest over some piece of the structure. Uh, we would be freer and more powerful and more human if in our normal experience we did not go to sleep. And our, our challenging of the structure, instead of occurring only exceptionally in, t in time of crisis, occurred all the time as a natural extension of these ordinary activities. In other words, the ordinary experience uh, would involve uh, not just these routine moves within a framework, but the extension of these moves into a challenging of pieces of the framework, little by little. There wouldn't be this stark discontinuity between the two. Uh, now, would the votaries of classical republicanism, uh, of civic republicanism, be happy to call that virtue? I don't know, because the term is located in that tradition, which, which seems to me dangerous and, and mythical. But that, ha that has a better claim to be called virtue. But virtue in the sense, it's, it's a it's a bigger version of humanity. It's more realistic, it's more promising. It's a better, has more promise of solution to those two sets of contradictions to which I referred. So that's just the beginning of begin, uh, how I would begin an argument about this, about this question. No, no, this is a very important issue. So, the, so I think when we were discussing it, and uh -huh. it's very clarifying in that point, um, uh, when we were discussing it, you know, when we talked about civic virtue, usually we meant a structure creating an expectation for the individual to both one, relate to each other in a certain way, mm -hmm. and relate to the structure in a certain way. Yes. Yes. So, like, like you mentioned, and in the way you described your vision, is it was much less reliant on soul craft of the individual and much more reliant on a, a different structure, you know, more plastic structure and more structure that's over corrigible and over the revision that you discussed. Um, do you think that distinction, how, how is that distinction right or wrong? You know, I, soul craft of a certain type. Uh, nation, whereas yours is 
So, but it depends now on the method and on the content of the soul craft. So, for example, we have anticipated a discussion of education, and we'll come back to it. Uh, education is soul craft, and uh, but the initial aim of education is not to instill some particular moral program in the individual. The initial program is to arouse the imagination, including the imagination of otherness, the ability to imagine other people. That's why we study literature, for example, because it arouses, it fortifies this ability to imagine human experience in the other. Uh, so that's soul craft. If we say education should be dialectical, it, everything should be presented from opposing points of view, that's soul craft. But it's not the soul craft that the defenders of civic republicanism might want, which is uh, a particular kind of citizen who forgets about his private interests and lives for the collective as they imagined, supposedly, the ancient Romans and Spartans did. Huh? Uh, so th that's why the words are all loaded, right? Because they, they carry the weight, the baggage, of these historical traditions. I think one of the intellectual complications that should be manifest in the way that I'm answering you is that, to me, there isn't a clear-cut discontinuity between the empirical and the normative, between what has to do with empowerment or agency, and what has to do with becoming <coughs> morally better. So to my mind, it's morally better uh, if we can live in a way that holds greater promise of resolving these contradictions so that the way in which we cooperate with one another in the economy does not subjugate us. So that's why the higher forms of free labor, cooperation, and self-employment are superior to uh, economically dependent wage labor because they hold more promise of our ability to connect with the others without paying a price of subjugation or depersonalization and so forth. So this is, this, this, as I say, this is not a, a morally empty program. It's a, a program that is informed by a certain vision of who we ultimately are and should become. And that vision is contestable. But I, I don't think that's what the, 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 the champions of virtue ethics and of civic republicanism have in mind. So I'm, I'm just trying to make explicit that, that confusion. No? So the, the, the plan for, for the argument of the course has uh, change somewhat uh, in this respect, that uh, I am presenting the main substantive themes one by one as a direct outgrowth of the criticism of institutionally conservative social democracy, the default position of the contemporary progressives, uh, rather than concentrating the discussion of the default position and then going on to these themes. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the sequence of themes more or less tracks the plan laid out in the syllabus. So today the discussion is the reorganization of the economic order. And in particular, the future or the alternative futures of what is now the
the most advanced practice of production. In the next class, uh, the theme is the reorganization of democracy, of democratic politics, and of the state. Uh, and that then completes these five structural problems that I claimed uh, lie beyond the horizon of institutionally conservative social democracy. And then I would complete the discussion of those five with, a, with an exploration of education. Soulcraft, as you said just now. Uh, given that all significant transformation in social life is a transformation of consciousness as well as of institutions. Uh, now, this is a very rich topic set out for today, and we may not be able to complete our discussion today. We may have reason to continue it next week. I uh, begin by describing to you the steps of the discussion that I have in mind. Uh, first, I want to begin by characterizing what is now the most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy. Because I believe that the, the direction that we take with respect to this most advanced practice of production is decisive, not just for our economic future, but for our future in general. In the second step, I want to simply signal four tendencies, four phenomena with which the present insular form of the knowledge economy is associated. In the third part of the discussion, I want to address directly the great enigma of the confinement of the knowledge economy. The most advanced practice of production is now present in every sector of production, but in every sector it appears as a fringe, excluding the vast majority of firms and of workers. Uh, and that confinement is the most powerful cause of both inequality and stagnation. Uh, in the fourth part of the discussion, I want to describe the dilemma of economic growth and of development to which this confinement of the knowledge economy gives rise. This is the problem that increasingly comes to, to, be, to lie at the center of world economic debates. Uh, in the fifth part of the discussion, I propose to explore three sets of requirements for the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy. Cognitive educational requirements, social moral requirements, and legal institutional requirements. And in the final part of the discussion, then, briefly to speak to the background conditions in politics and in culture that make it more or less likely that we would be able to satisfy those three sets of requirements. So really, this discussion, if it were to do justice to each of these six steps, would occupy the entirety of the course. So let's see how we, how we manage to deal with this. Huh? Um, now, before I say anything about the knowledge economy, Let me restate a crucial analytical premise of this entire argument, a premise to which I've referred several times before. 
Uh, the premise is that a market economy has no single natural and necessary legal and institutional form. Uh, we tend to think, given the dominant ideas in economic and political thought, that there are basically only two kinds of things that we can do with a market. We can regulate it more or less, and we can compensate more or less for the inequalities that it generates by resorting to after the fact redistribution through tax and transfer, through progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements. But on these views, the, the views that inform my arguments, there's something much more important that we can do with the market, which is we can change its legal and institutional architecture. Now, this is in direct contradiction to the hydraulic model that has dominated ideological controversy for over two centuries. The hydraulic model is that the axis of ideological debate is a contest between the market and government. More market, less state. More state, less market. Or some balance between market and state, which is supposedly social democracy or social liberalism. But here the idea is that the fundamental question with respect to the market is not how much market, but which market, which market order. That's the crucial analytical premise. And although it might seem to you very uh, innocent, uh, it actually represents a, uh, a vital inflection in the, in the course of the ideological debate. Now then, the most advanced practice of production. Uh, I propose to discuss the reorganization of the economic order from a particular perspective, from the perspective of a single theme. And the theme is the nature and future of the most advanced practice of production. Now, in a sense, this position of mine is entirely orthodox. Uh, the two greatest thinkers in the history of economics, uh, Karl Marx and Adam Smith, shared the view that the best way to understand the fundamentals of economic life and its possibilities was to study the most advanced practice of production in their historical circumstance. For them, it was mass production preceded by mechanized manufacturing. And for us, it is something else. Uh, the present position of this advanced practice of production has decisive consequences for both economic growth and economic inequality. But what is this most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy? The, now, it's the characterization of this form of production. This is a discussion that's more complicated than it seems to be for the following reason. A practice of production reveals its character and its potential only as it is becoming disseminated. So in other words, it deepens as it spreads. But this most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy, uh, now exists, I will, will claim, in a very confined form as a series of fringes. And because it exists only as a series of fringes, it does not easily reveal its true nature. 
uh, that's, why the, that's why the characterization of the knowledge economy is, is, is troubling and difficult. At the most superficial level, we associate it with the accumulation of technology, capital, and knowledge and with a particular set of technologies. Uh, 3D printers or additive manufacturing, robotics, artificial learning, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. In other words, the, the higher order or so-called digital technologies. Uh, and therefore, we easily identify it with high technology industry as United States, Silicon Valley. But in truth, the knowledge economy, as I understand it, is now present in every sector of the economy. In knowledge intensive services and scientific precision agriculture, as well as in high tech industry. It has no unique sectoral association. So let's go then to the next level of characterization of the knowledge economy. At the level of production engineering, the organization of production or of work. So here there are two sets of defining characteristics. The first set is the reconciliation of customization or destandardization of products and services with production at scale. So destandardization or customization was associated with a, an, an abdication of scale, as in craft production. So in the age of mass production, the alternative to mass production was craft production. Craft production was customized, but not at scale. Mass production was at scale, but not customized. Here we have a form of production that seeks to be both destandardized, capable of indefinite variation, and at scale. The second set of characteristics at this level of production engineering has to do with the reconciliation of decentralized initiative with the preservation of coherence and momentum in the process of production. I gave once the military analogy. So it's like a guerrilla operation or a special force rather than like a traditional infantry battalion. But the difference is this, that at least in the potential of this form of production, we have the idea to pursue the military analogy, that the whole army could begin to take on the characteristics of an irregular force without losing its, its ability to operate in a coherent and cumulative fashion. Now we come to the deeper characteristics at a third level. And these are characteristics that are only intimated or prefigured by the present confined form of the knowledge economy. So the first characteristic has to do with the loosening or even the supersession of what may be the, the most universal constraint in economic life. If there is any regularity in economic life that has a claim to be considered a law, it is the so-called law of diminishing marginal returns. If you keep all inputs to a process of production constant, and if you increase one of those inputs. Uh, initially, there will be an, an, a proportionate increase of output, then will stabilize, and then will decline. 
That's diminishing marginal productivity. Now, many students of the knowledge economy have observed that the knowledge economy seems to have the tendency or the potential to loosen or even to reverse this constraint of diminishing returns. And uh, sometimes this is uh, described or explained as having to do with the character of knowledge. So as we develop knowledge, the more we understand, the easier it is to develop our understanding at the next step. So there's some loose intuitive conception <coughs> that the reason why the knowledge economy loosens the constraint of diminishing returns is that it participates in our mental experience more than it participates in merely natural processes. But this is an undeveloped intuition. And so I want to make a more specific proposal uh, in the effort to justify or explain this feature of the knowledge economy. In all previous practices of production, uh, innovation, the fundamental source of rise of productivity, technological innovation and organizational innovation, is relatively external to the process of production. And it is episodic or discontinuous. Uh, now, in the knowledge economy, we have the promise of a practice of innovation that is intrinsic or endogenous to the process of production, and that is perpetual. It goes on all the time, the deeper, the more radicalized the knowledge economy is. And this intrinsic and perpetual character of innovation to the extent that it's realized in practice would then explain at least the, the potential to loosen this most universal regularity of economic life, the constraint of diminishing returns. Now we come to a second set of these deeper characteristics of the knowledge economy. These are the characteristics that have to do with the relation between our productive activity and our mental experience. The knowledge economy draws together the, our experience of scientific discovery or invention and our productive efforts. So the best firms become more like the best schools. Work in production is increasingly organized as if it were a process of continuous scientific discovery. So think, for example, of one of the characteristic technologies, even in the early stages of the knowledge economy the 3D printer, so-called additive manufacturing. Uh, it allows you to go very quickly back and forth between a conjecture of a certain product and the materialization of the product. So you materialize it, and then the materialization suggests variations, and you change your conjecture. So it accelerates this process of back and forth between conception and execution, between conjecture and materialization. Uh, in these earlier processes of production, uh, production was supported by science embodied in technology. 
Now, in a sense, production becomes the materialization of science. There's a much closer relation. And one uh, side of that affinity, of that intimacy, then is, lies in the, in the organization of work. So a work team becomes like a team of scientific discovery. And another aspect has to do with the potential for a change in the relation of the worker to the machine. So before, in the earlier advanced practices of production, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines. In Adam Smith's pin factory or Henry Ford's assembly line, the worker worked as if he were a reflection of one of his machines, the same formulaic movements. Now the machines are more advanced, but the potential is created for the worker to be something fundamentally different from the machine. So everything that we've learned how to repeat, we express in a formula or an, or an algorithm. And whatever we can express in a formula or an algorithm, we embody in the physical contraption, the machine. The point of the machine is then to preserve our supreme resource, <coughs> our time, for what we have not yet learned how to repeat. And the idea then becomes that, that, that work is organized as this partnership between the machine and the anti-machine. The anti-machine is the human being. Now, this conception is a little too simple for the following reason. Let's give a, 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 tell a, a fable, a simple narrative about the, the evolution of technology in world history. So you could say that up to very recently, uh, almost all machines were what you could describe as formulaic machines. It's the formula or the algorithm. They, we encode in them what we've learned how to repeat, and then they do it for us. Now it seems that there's a, a, a second category, which you could call problem-solving machines, developed through artificial intelligence and machine learning. So they then solve practical problems that may not be easily reducible to a formula or an algorithm. They may be complex problems, like uh, building a driverless vehicle, autonomous vehicles. Or they may be even relatively simple problems, but they are surprisingly difficult to solve, like how to open a doorknob. But they have this pragmatic, problem-solving character. So we're now in the early stages of developing machines of that kind. Say that's the second level of machines. But now comes the third level, which has, a, as it were, the refuge of the human being, of the imagination, which not even in principle a machine could do. We can randomize a machine. We can create, develop its problem-solving capabilities as I just described. But what we cannot do is to give it the power to imagine. So what does the imagination do? The imagination distances itself from the phenomenon and subsumes the phenomenon under a range of transformative variation. The imagination discovers something that the established methods and presuppositions uh, make senseless. They don't allow it. But the imagination discovers it anyway, and then retrospectively develops the methods and the presuppositions that make sense of it. That's the imagination. And it seems that not even in principle could a machine be capable of imagination. So uh, 
this view uh, is, again, another instance of what we were describing at the beginning of class, a conception of humanity. And now I can restate that conception of humanity as a conception of the mind. The mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is modular and formulaic. It's like a machine. In another side, the mind is not modular or not formulaic. It can combine everything with everything else, the power that we call recursive infinity in, in mathematics. And it has this ability to defy its own methods and presuppositions. And that's what we call the imagination. So there are two sides of the mind, the machine side and the anti-machine side, the imagination. And nothing in the physical constitution of the brain predetermines the relative force of these two sides of the mind. The relative force of these two sides of the mind is determined by the organization of politics and of culture. And in this sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. So the knowledge economy bears on this. It has consequences for this fact. It has a momentous significance and potential. Yes. Yes. Should have the character of the knowledge economy mm -hmm. of free activity to a lot of people. Yes. The society to be a bunch of guerrilla uh, uh, imaginable uh, mm -hmm. players. We don't like that the idea that the current knowledge economy is having the, the big loss of People yes. Well, more than just owned by private economic agents, dominated by a very small number of mega firms. And we are not talking about funds, we're talking about also people because yes. they are stronger than the hospitals sometimes. Yes. So if I want to say we can if I want to take a sound bite, we want when we look at the on the future regime that we would like uh, to be a part of yes. a moral regime, we would like to take to democratize the knowledge economy of course. and democratize the society through the characteristics of, of the course, society. of course. This is what we Right? I mean, but, but if, you know, I'm going through this laborious description of the practice of production, not in its current form, but in its potential. And of course, I realize the danger that I could be misinterpreted as somehow describing Silicon Valley or something like that, which, is, which, is, which, which makes no sense, of course, because what I'm saying is we, we, we have to understand the logic or the potential of this practice of production which now is, is, appears in the world in this radically truncated and therefore as well superficial form. So we're going to come to that, to this superficial form in a minute, but by steps now. Uh, so there's one more set of deeper characteristics to mention, and that is the transformation of the moral culture of production. Mass production and the established economic regimes were characterized by the universalization of low trust. So this was the idea of the social theorists like Max Weber, Zimmel. Uh, in the pre-market societies, in the traditional societies, there was a division between the treatment of insiders and the treatment of strangers. So all trust to the insiders, no trust to the strangers. And the market economy required the universalization of a modicum of low trust among strangers. 
That's the conventional market economy, and that's mass production. Uh, the world of low trust. And in that world, we can define a market economy as a form of simplified cooperation among strangers that is impossible when there is no trust and unnecessary when there is high trust. Uh, but now comes this new practice of production, this knowledge economy, which begins to alter the moral presuppositions of market activity. Because uh, in order to develop, it demands from its part, it demands and it allows its participants a relatively higher degree of trust and discretion. So a heightening of the level of reciprocal trust among all participants in the process of production. Remember the military analogy. So uh, in, the, in the infantry forces of, auto, of the autocratic European states uh, up to the beginning of the 19th century, you had an army of conscript peasants in a tight formation. Uh, new technology developed, artillery, and they were unable to use the artillery effectively because the effective use of the artillery required great mobility in the field. But they couldn't have great mobility. They couldn't have great mobility because the army was composed of reluctant peasants who would run away if they could. So standing behind them were a group of people with bayonets who would uh, pierce them if they tried to run away. And that, of course, uh, greatly reduced the ability to use the, to use the technology. So, that, so, 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 yeah, so, that's, so that's the opposite, right? So, so here we have a world which is going in the opposite direction. It, it, it requires a great degree of decentralized initiative heightens the level of trust. And instead of allocating cooperation and competition to rigidly distinct domains of activity, it mixes them up. And that's what we call cooperative competition. So groups within firms or whole firms in a particular industry, like biotech, for example, will cooperate and compete at the same time. This is a, a remarkable change in, in, the, in the moral culture of production. Uh, and that, therefore, a third attribute of the, of the knowledge economy. So there's the knowledge economy. I, I've given a description of it, not as it exists, but as a practice of production with a certain logic of tendencies and of potential uh, at, the, at this level. The next thing we have to do is confront that vision with its reality. But let's stop for a moment there. And I ask you if, if, there, if, you, if you want to discuss some aspect of that, of that picture of the model of the, of the knowledge economy. Yes? where it comes from. So, so, so if you take those deeper, so the superficial characteristics are obvious, huh? like the Toyota method of production. Huh? Uh, and that's what the knowledge economy has been mainly known for. So the, the deeper characteristics are also not just surmises. They exist also. They're, they're actual things, but they exist under this great constraint in these truncated or perverted forms. So each of those characteristics. It is true that in a whole set of ways, the knowledge economy, even in its fragmentary and superficial form, seems not wholly to conform to the law of diminishing marginal returns of product. Uh, and that's associated with certain other characteristics of scale in the knowledge economy that benefit above all the mega firms. 
Similarly, with all the other characteristics, uh, the 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 worker in the most advanced forms of the knowledge economy does not have to work as one of his machines. There's a different kind of association between worker and machine. Uh, and for that reason, the most effective form of vocational or technical training is no longer a training in job-specific and machine-specific skills, but in higher order capabilities that are useful for the reprogramming of numerically controlled machine tools. And if you take the uh, third set of deeper characteristics, they too are manifest. So for example, there are empirical studies comparing the relatively greater success of Silicon Valley in the United States with the relatively more limited success of Route 128 around Boston. And a common observation among the, the, the students uh, uh, of, this, uh, of these industrial regions is that Silicon Valley is more successful, among other reasons, because there's a much higher degree of cooperative competition. There's a circulation of people, resources, practices, and ideas among the firms more than there is here. And that that is a differential factor in success. So all of these features that I've mentioned are, are manifest in economic reality. They're manifest in a very limited way. And what I'm doing in this analytical exercise is, as it were, to project these tendencies and to imagine how they would be manifest in a more disseminated and radicalized version. There's a crucial premise, which is not self-evident and requires further reflection. The premise is the one that I mentioned, that there's a causal connection between deepening and dissemination. A practice of production only deepens by spreading. Because by spreading, it has to adapt to a wide range of circumstances and then confront the challenges of this diversity, and then it becomes deeper. It reveals more of this potential that I projected in this, in this description. That, that's the kind of account. Now, yes? So first of, all, first of all, let me say about cooperative competition, referring to an earlier historical example that I gave, that it has characterized many previous forms of economic life. So I gave, for example, the, the, I gave the example of the creation in the first half of the 19th century of the United States of a new kind of agricultural market. One of the attributes of family-scale agriculture in the United States was cooperative competition. So there was partnership between the government and the family farmer. And among the family farmers, there was cooperative competition, meaning they were independent proprietors and entrepreneurs. They competed against one another, but they pooled. They pooled resources. Uh, they pooled commercial facilities, uh, technologies. Uh, they even pooled their own labor, uh, helping one another out at harvest time even while they competed. That's cooperative competition. And now we see cooperative competition all the time in many areas of the knowledge economy, uh, famously in the pharmaceutical or biotechnology industry. And it has a whole set of legal manifestations. For example, that the contracts among the cooperative, the cooperating firms are ongoing relational incomplete contracts rather than the standard bilateral executory promise that is exhausted in a single performance. So all, all of this already exists. Uh, and the question is, how are we to interpret it, the larger meaning or potential Now comes the second step, 
then of this exploration, which is, I say, the knowledge economy as it exists, exists under quarantine. It is quarantined. It's not quarantined in a particular sector. It's quarantined in a fringe that exists in every sector. And indeed, the distinction among sectors is breaking down. Because advanced manufacturing, in, under this new practice of production, in a sense consists mainly of crystallized intellectual services. The materialization part is secondary. Uh, so that's how it exists. It exists in this fringe form, and I want in the third step of the discussion to come to the enigma of this confinement. But before that, I, I, taking the confinement as a fact without yet trying to explain it or explore its significance, I want to point to four phenomena that the, the confined knowledge economy is associated because that's part of this reality that we're trying to understand. So the first phenomenon is a momentous change in the world division of labor. The premise of traditional trade theory was that world trade is organized primarily on the, on the basis of exchange between capital intensive advanced and labor intensive, relatively more bad. But now we have another situation in which this vanguard of production is established in every major economy of the world, in the major middle income continental developing countries, as well as in the richest economies. Although in, in all of them, as a series of islands. And in fact, these vanguards throughout the world are in direct communion with one another, exchanging people, practices, resources, ideas. So it's not just that the knowledge economy is not spreading to the production system as a whole. It's that the opposite phenomenon is happening. So the firms that occupy the commanding heights of the knowledge economy have discovered a way to routinize or to commoditize parts of the process of production. And they then subcontract these routinized or commoditized parts of production to workers and firms in other parts of the world where the tax burden and the labor costs are much lower. So a worldwide labor and tax arbitrage. And let's, so this is then a kind of math which operates as the sidekick, let's call it the sidekick, of the productive vanguard. So mass production now exists in the world in two different forms, which shouldn't be confused. One form is the sidekick. It operates as an integral part of the process of production by the productive vanguard. The other is as the leftover. The leftover of the earlier stage, not connected with the productive vanguard. And these two systems have very different, uh, very different systems. Uh, uh, the, the third phenomenon that is associated with this situation, let me call pseudo-vanguardism. So the, the, the firms of the knowledge economy produce products and services that are widely bought. 
by individuals and by other firms. But the mere acquisition of these products and services does not turn these economic agents and firms into members of the productive vanguard. So let's take a, 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 a striking example. So a firm like Walmart, a very large scale, that deals with complex information, acquires uh, some of these technologies, and that then provides a one-time boost to productivity. But Walmart is not part of the productive vanguard just because it's using computers to do what the, uh, to manage what the economists call a multi-dimensional multi matrix to uh, administer its inventory, to manage its inventory on just-in-time principles. It continues to be where it was before, a hierarchical command and control organization uh, uh, in no way representative of these deeper attributes of the knowledge economy. So, for example, the United States, there was in the period from 1994 to 205, a spike in productivity. Productivity had slowed down before and s continued to slow down afterwards, but there was this period. And one of the possible explanations of the spike is that that was the period in which these non-members of the vanguard assimilated the advanced technologies and practices of production, and that produced this one-time boost in productivity. Now, the fourth phenomenon, then, is precarious employment. So this situation of global supply chain organized by the relation between the vanguard and the sidekick is associated with the erosion of labor rights, uh, especially in the rich capital-intensive economies. Uh, mass production was the economic basis for the classical representation of labor and for the left or center-left parties in the North Atlantic countries. And the, the subversion of mass production then results in a shaking uh, of, this, of this basis. Uh, the collective representation of labor was preceded in the West by several centuries in which labor was organized on the basis of a network of decentralized contractual arrangements, so-called putting out system. And now it seems that a putting out system is being reestablished on a global scale. So what we think of as the natural form of the representation of labor may turn out to be a relatively brief interlude in the period from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century during two much longer periods in which labor was organized on the basis of these decentralized contractual arrangements. So the world in which the advanced practice of production appears as a fringe or a series of fringes is the same world that has these four sets of characteristics that I just described. The change in the world division of labor, the hyperinsularity, the pseudo-vanguardism, and the worldwide spread of precarious employment. So this if the progressives are going to have a program in the world, it better be a program that masters this reality. This is, this is the reality. And uh, simple compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer is manifestly <coughs> inadequate to, to deal with this reality. So there's the second step of the discussion. Comments about this? So this is a more familiar description because all of these phenomena are phenomena that are widely recognized. Uh, 
they're widely recognized, but they, they, they aren't usually seen as being connected, and in particular connected to this situation of the insularity of the knowledge economy, as I believe that they are. Now then we come to the third step of the discussion, which is the enigma of confinement. The advanced practice of production is contained, it's confined. Why is it contained and confined? So there are a set, there are a set of familiar arguments that explain this on the basis of uh, straightforward economic reality. Production in the knowledge economy seems to have characteristics that disproportionately benefit firms of very large scale. So one of these are the so-called network characteristics that once you go beyond a certain threshold of participants in a platform, there's a huge advantage for the firms that have this wide platform of millions of people over those that, that don't. And that's then associated with the other characteristic of the knowledge economy, that uh, the products and services of the knowledge economy can be scaled up at very little or zero marginal cost by just pressing a button or giving a new set of customers in one country or in other countries access. So that would explain why firms of a very large scale would benefit disproportionately. But there's a problem with this explanation, which is although the knowledge economy exists as a fringe or a set of fringes, it doesn't exist just as a set of large firms. There is a world of startups, of small firms, of emergent firms uh, that continues to flourish, but flourish in the fringe. So it seems that there has to be a second category of explanations. And the second category of explanations in this view has to do with the very demanding requirements of the knowledge economy. By comparison to mass production. So let's go back to classical development economics, by which I mean the development economics of the second half of the 20th century. The central message of classical development economics was the shortcut to economic growth is sectoral transfer. That's what they call structural change. It's to take workers and resources from the relatively less productive sectors of the economy and put them in the relatively more productive sector. And that meant mainly take them from agriculture and put them in industry. Conventional industry for this mass production. At the same time, there was a genuflection to the so-called fundamentals, education and institutions. But what classical development economics demanded by way of institutions was very little. It demanded simply a regulated mixed economy that gave in the state a significant role to the development planners. And by education, despite the lift service paid to education, it required almost nothing. A disposition to obey, rudimentary literacy and numeracy, and physical dexterity. That's all it needed. So mass production was characterized by two sets of related characteristics with respect to this issue. First, it was very stereotypical in the range of its machines and skills. 
a, a narrow kit of machines and of skills that could be, as it were, transported from one country to another. And the reason why it could be transported was associated with a second characteristic, which is the minimalism of its requirements, as I just said. The minimal institutional and educational requirements. So it seemed to offer unconditional convergence to the situation of the most advanced economies of the world on the basis of this stereotypical and minimalist characteristic. It no longer works. That's an argument at the next step. But it was very attractive while it worked. So the knowledge economy is not like that. The knowledge economy is not stereotypical. And it seems to be very demanding in its requirements. Its educational requirements, its social moral requirements, the accumulation of social capital, and its legal institutional requirements, if it is to be disseminated. Now, that's at least the beginning of an explanation of the confinement. But now the question is, why is this so important? So first, it's important for economic growth and stagnation. So you know that in the United States now, there's a discourse that goes under the label of secular stagnation, a label of the economist of the 1920s, Alvin Hansen. And this discourse attempts to naturalize the slowing of economic growth and of the growth of productivity, attributing it, for example, to the supposedly more limited potential of contemporary technologies when compared with the technologies of 100 years ago. To me, this is very hard to understand. It's hard to imagine what technology could have more potential than artificial intelligence even conceptually. Uh, the most plausible reason for persistent stagnation in these economies seems obvious. How could there not be stagnation if the most advanced practice is confined, almost by definition? So if, if, the, most con if the most advanced practice of production the one with the greatest potential, not just to reach the frontier of productivity, but to hold that frontier and to inspire transformation around it. If that practice is quarantined, is limited, if the vast majority of firms and workers are excluded from it, then there will be relative stagnation. So that's the significance for economic growth. And the significance for inequality is almost as straightforward. There is a hierarchical segmentation of the economy between advanced and backward sectors. The relative size of the advanced part, rather than increasing, diminishes what I call hyperinsulary. So the chasm between the advanced part of the economy and the rest deepens. And that chasm then becomes a source of massive inequality and exclusion. The, the two traditional devices for the moderation of inequality, which are compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer and the defense of small business against big business, are manifestly insufficient to deal with these massive inequalities that are located in the structural organization of the economy and it's in this hierarchical segmentation. The only adequate procedure would be one that attempted to change the underlying reality. That's, that's the argument. Now, that is manifestly what, the, in general, the progressives don't have. On the whole, they don't have a project for dealing with that reality. And they continue to 
insist on, a, on this policy of retrospective correction of the hierarchical segmentation of, of its effects for inequality through compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer. So conceptually, there's, there's a problem which should be clear. It's, it's what we've discussed several times before. The distinction between changing the arrangements that define access to economic and educational opportunity and therefore shape the primary distribution of economic advantage, as opposed to initiatives that simply attempt to correct influencing the secondary distribution. So the, 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 almost the entire project of the progressives has been limited to this secondary distribution. And that has no prospect of success. It has a legitimate role. And it's significant and even indispensable, but as accessory to some structural program, not as a substitute for a structural program. No, that's the enigma of confinement. Now, I'm not demanding that you argue against this view. Uh, of course, I'm happy to hear arguments against it. But uh, uh, speak in any way. How, what do you think, first of all, is it is, is this argument clear? And what could someone say who is skeptical of the existence of an alternative? Uh, perhaps yes. the greatest objection would be uh, to say that you're trying to have your, to have your cake and eat it. Uh, you're trying to overcome the limitations that language imposes on us. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're saying that there are no trade-offs, trade uh, and that you, you, you can both have the benefits of A and the benefits of uh, non-A. Uh, you mean with respect, for example, to the tension between equity and efficiency? Absolutely, and I, I, I think that's something that pervades all of the distinctions. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so it's true in, in this respect. So this is a very important point. So. The, the rhetoric, the discourse of equity and efficiency, to me, to my mind, is a discourse that only makes sense if we're <coughs> speaking about this corrective redistribution. Because the economic order is organized in a certain way. It has arrangements and incentives. And if the corrective redistribution goes beyond a certain threshold, then it begins to derange the economic order. Uh, upsetting its, uh, its structure of incentives, interfering with the system of relative prices, and so forth. And the whole discourse of a tension between equity and efficiency is simply an expression of that reality. Uh, it's true. There is this tension. But the tension is a tension that exists at the level of corrective redistribution. Now, if we are intervening in the arrangements that shape the original distribution, it's a different story. That's not to say that there wouldn't be other tensions or that tension in a certain form, but not this simple contradiction between equity and efficiency. Going back to the examples we were just discussing, like the American agricultural example. If you innovate in the structural organization of the agricultural market and create the institutional and educational foundations for a system of family-scale entrepreneurial farming, you are diminishing inequality and increasing productivity at the same time. Now, there'd be other contradictions, other problems that would arise in the course of that effort, but there wouldn't be the simple contrast that we have when we're operating simply at the level of corrective redistribution. So, that, so that's the argument. And, and the, if we go back a step to the whole attitude commanding this argument, I, I am throughout defending the following position. Now, 
the progressives appear on the historical scene as the humanizers. So they have seen, and particularly in the economic debates, they have ceded the supply side of the economy to the conservatives. And to the extent that they have ideas about the economy, they're all on the demand side, on the, on the consumption side. And thus, to the extent they have a theory, their theory is vulgar Keynesianism. The, 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 so they then allow the conservatives, the right, to embody the cause of constructive energy. And they complain that the form that the right gives to constructive energy is savage or unjust. So they humanize it. But they accept the underlying premise that they're not the energizers, they're the humanizers. Now, that is a, a that, that's a position in politics that's defeated before the fight even begins, to my mind, because in, 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 a, in a real historical struggle, the force that will command the agenda is the force that most plausibly represents the cause of innovation, of construction, of, of the new, of, uh, of the development, of wealth, of power. Uh, and, uh, to see that cause is uh, a drastic retreat to, a, to what is essentially a defeated position. So that's, that's the view that I'm taking. That's the, that's the axis of the controversy. And you're right that I'm saying that the change of terrain uh, undercuts this simple contrast between equity and efficiency which is not the same thing as saying that there are not other, these or other contradictions in other forms, but not in that canonical form, which is the form confronted by this corrective social democracy. Uh, so that's a very, I, I can't really think of any more fundamental contrast in the present political situation. So the question to ask an institutionally conservative social democrat or social liberal is precisely that question. Do you see this terrain of the supply side of the economy, of the system of production, of the structure of the economy to the other side? And do you take this position as the humanizer? Or do you have a proposal for the reorganization of the process of production? the creation of wealth, and more generally, the creation of novelty and innovation in the world. Uh, that is absolutely fundamental. And uh, it's strange, isn't it, that the, the alternative is rarely, if ever, debated in those terms. The, but those are the terms that seem most 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 pertinent. Yes. So I have a question. Um, um, so I see that this class is we were trying to imagine or see an alternative uh, situation. But my question is, even if there is an alternative, how are we ever going to achieve it? Because a lot of it is based on culture, and we were talking about like changing life. War economy. Yeah, yeah, the war economy. You know, yeah. people are just like working together, coordinating, and coordinating yeah. those features. But, but it's an extreme situation that's also based on culture. And um, if you don't like, uh, and, and, and in the other class where you know in Tolkien, um, if, if there's a third one, people are not, you know, like there's no attractive lights, but there there are any classes and all yeah. that. I mean, I think that comes from a lot of repetition and culture. Yeah. Um, but whatever we suggest that as an alternative, how will we realistically approach that? And you know, right now, I'm not even. Well, first, so I think first with respect to culture or consciousness. So we have to be careful not to reify culture, right? Because what we regard as cultural is 
uh, always to some extent an artifact, a creation of statecraft, of institutional arrangements, as well as of the form of education. So uh, Japan, after the Second World War, began to be regarded as a solidaristic culture of groupthink, of solidarity with the group, with the corporation, under the life employment system. But in the 1920s and 30s, Japanese industrial relations were among the most violent and conflictual in the whole world. So the reality is that, that uh, much of what is considered cultural is also shaped by practical arrangements and, and susceptible to change. Now, the second thing I want to say by way of response to you is that these are inescapable practical problems that have to be solved one way or the other for a whole range of reasons that have to do with material interests, not just with moral tendencies. So for example, deindustrialization in the United States, the, the decline of the so-called Rust Belt, and the dispossession of the white working class majority of the country. That's an objective problem. It's not a cultural problem. Uh, uh, it, it seems that both the right wing populists and the progressive Democrats in the United States think that the only solution to that problem is to buy a few more years for mass production. To make plant closings more difficult, to uh, prolong the life of the air conditioner factory in Indiana or, or whatever. This isn't a serious project. Uh, at, at best, you could say, this is just buying a little more time. Uh, and that if, if there is to be a response to this problem, uh, ensuring the continued economic growth of the United States and coming to the assistance of the traditional industrial working class, there has to be some conversion of declining mass production, the leftover, as I called it, into something else. Uh, and that's, a required, that's, that's an objective imperative of political economy. Uh, uh, it's not as if there were political forces in the United States offering such solutions, proposing them, and then being rejected out of cultural reasons. It seems that the situation is that there are no forces in the United States offering such alternatives. So the, we're, we're at, a, a, at a much more fundamental level of the, of the discussion, trying to expand the repertory of the, institution, of the institutional and policy options. Now, let, let, me, let me conclude this part of the discussion before we actually come to the heart of it, which is the requirements for deepening and dissemination of the advanced practice of production by describing what has become the central dilemma of economic growth. This is the fourth step of the discussion. Uh, fifth? Fourth or fifth? What? The watch? Oh, I dropped it. OK. Uh, um, not just in the major developing countries, but in the, in, in the rich ones as well. So here's the dilemma. Conventional industrialization no longer works to guarantee economic success. There is premature industrialization or deindustrialization all over the world. And in particular, it no longer works to do what classical development economics wanted it to do, which is to allow the developing countries to have a shortcut and have unconditional convergence to the situation of the richest economies. Why does it no longer work? So here are four reasons why it no longer works. 
course, it no longer works because this belated Fordism has ceased to be the most advanced practice of production. It doesn't bring you to the top of the world economy. It brings you to what the top was 50 years ago. And in a subordinate position in the global change of production. The second reason why it no longer works is that the combination of the insular vanguard with the sidekick is increasingly able to outproduce and outcompete the leftover. So it can produce the same products that the leftover has been producing better with more variation and at lower cost. The third reason is that in the circumstance to which it is relegated of being either the sidekick or the leftover, belated mass production is caught in a race to the bottom in this worldwide labor and tax arbitrage to find the countries that offer the lowest returns to labor and the lowest tax charge. And the fourth reason is that the underlying contrast among sectors is being progressively attenuated. So the whole distinction of uh, the, the sectoral distinction is being effaced. I gave the example of the breakdown of the contrast between services and manufacturing, between advanced manufacturing and intellectually intensive services. The situation is different. The, 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 the advanced practice of production is multi-sectoral, but in all the sectors, it's a fringe. So conventional industrialization no longer works. If we try to save it, all we do is buy a little more time which is what uh, this, this backward-looking political economy of, the, uh, of both the, <coughs> the left-leading and right-leading forces now generally does in the North Atlantic world. Yes? Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by the underlying contrast being progressively attenuated? Of sectors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I gave this example of... of uh, the relation between advanced manufacturing and services. So they're harder and harder to distinguish what's, manu what's manufacturing and what services. So if there are a bunch of people in California inventing these things, uh, what are they, when, what business are they in? Is it, an, is it industry or is it services? Uh, there is a materialization of some of what they do later there can be you know, uh, a million belated Fordist workers in China producing something that they invented. But that's almost as if it were an afterthought to the central activity, given the hyper, the hyper insularity. And you could extend the argument to agriculture. Uh, the more agriculture becomes scientific and even begins to efface the distinction between natural and synthetic foods, it doesn't make sense anymore to distinguish agriculture from industry and from services. So the whole idea that there's this fixed sectoral distinction begins to break down and is replaced by this hierarchy of imaginative powers within all the sectors that are in some way mixed together. That, that's the empirical claim. Now, so that's one horn of the dilemma, the, the, the shortcut the, the route through conventional industrialization has stopped working. But what's the alternative? The alternative would be an inclusive form of the knowledge economy that would be deepened and disseminated. Now, where does that alternative exist? Nowhere. So that's, so that's the problem. And if you're looking at it from the standpoint of one of the continental developing countries, They'll say, you asked me to promote uh, uh, an inclusive form of the knowledge economy. That doesn't exist in the United States or Germany or, or uh, Japan or even Israel. 
how, how are you going to expect to create it in here, in India and in China and Brazil, uh, where everything is more difficult and all these institutional and educational conditions are even more fragile? That's the dilemma. It's very simple and it's dramatic. The conventional formula of economic growth has stopped working and the alternative seems to be beyond reach. Uh, that's the heart of the problem. So that's what, that is the issue that deserves to come to the center of the world debate in political economy. And uh, to me, it seems to me that in principle, there's only one prospect of solving it. And the only prospect of solving it is to make what seems to be beyond reach be within reach. To take that task, which seems impossible because it's too large, and break it up into pieces and steps so it becomes accessible within, within the reins of the adjacent possible. And if, if, we, if we take this position that the progressives have to have a project for construction, for creation, for energy, for the supply side of the economy as well as for the demand side, that has, that has to be one of the <coughs> central programmatic concerns. So if we step back now in the structure of the argument that's emerging here in the course, there are three central concerns. The first is the transformation of the economic order. Addressing this problem of the, the, the deepening and dissemination of the most advanced practice of production. The second large project is the deepening of democracy. The creation of uh, high energy democracy that no longer needs crisis as the condition of change. And the third large project is the formation of the individual, soul craft, as you called it, uh, through a form of education that renders the individual capable of turning the tables on the context in which he finds himself. Those are the three great emancipatory projects. Yes? So deepening the knowledge economy doesn't necessarily seem emancipatory to me in that it basically just seems like converting the perverse joy of consumption into the perverse joy of production. How is that liberatory? Yeah. Well, so we'll come to this argument, but let me say this. So um, Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes shared the following two views. One view is that scarcity is about to be overcome. And the second view is that work is a hateful burden, a necessarily instrumental and dehumanizing and getting in the way of our pursuit of the sublime. So it's fortunate that scarcity is about to be overcome because then we'll be able to cast off this hateful burden in the next historical stage. Now, uh, I think, first of all, scarcity is not about to be overcome. Scarcity is constantly reproduced in new forms in the history of these societies. But on the other hand, their second thesis is also mistaken because work is not necessarily a hateful burden. And the economy, rather than being just a terrain of constraint and belittlement, can also be a terrain of empowerment, of the enhancement of agency, of self-transformation through the transformation, of the, the transformation of the world around us. Uh, and I think I've already said enough about the knowledge economy, the relation between work and imagination, the change in the moral culture of production, 
to suggest why that might be true. So that's the claim, that, that uh, there's no alternative to engaging with the transformation of the institutional structure and of material life. We're, we're, we're not in the position that we can somehow get over it, uh, get over the basic phenomenon of scarcity, and then devote ourselves to private sublimities. Uh, so that's, a, that's, I suppose, that's another fundamental contrast of views uh, about what we, can, what we can expect from the material life of society. We're out of time, but this discussion then will continue because we haven't even gotten to the central part. Yeah, definitely should be. Yeah. 